Kind of high school, I was a, a horrible music student by the time I got to high school. Just, you know, I guess girls or athletes, everything except studies. I was, I was a horrible student in high school. I just was a horrible student. I wanted to play sports and play band. But fortunately, I got into a band outside of, outside of school that we played covers. We played R&B covers, Wilson Pickett, Dyke and the Blazers, James Brown, Motown. And this was good. This was good because around the 14, 9th grade, I started in this band, and we played, and we we worked. We worked. I worked a lot then. We worked Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I had a little uh, first band was called Little Richard and the Soul Brothers, and then uh, Incredible Music Makers. Then a band called the Majestics. This was high school, and that's why I was such a horrible student because we didn't go to classes. Like we played, we cut classes and stayed in the cafeteria all day. All we talked about was music and stuff like that. And uh, I, was in, I was involved into lacrosse. I wanted to play lacrosse, this American game. And I, was, I went to college, I played lacrosse first year of college. And once again, I was a horrible athlete because I didn't have a work ethic. I just thought you just hang and stuff. And then a friend of mine went to the school, State University of New York, College at Old Westbury. And there was a teacher there named Ken McIntyre, who's a very well-known read player, Makanda Ken McIntyre. And kind of then I, I kind of changed my life about music and my commitment. And people always ask me what was his greatest gift to me. And I think work ethic. He taught me about it. you got to develop a work ethic. And then, and then Westbury, I went to Westbury, you know, matriculated with a lot of very good musicians. We supported each other a lot. And then the la uh, my last year, Pat Patrick was teaching at Westbury at that time. Pat Patrick was one of the original members of Sunrise Orchestra. So he told me to come down to the club. I remember June 4th, 1976. He said, come down to the bottom line. It was a club on Mercer Street in uh, West 4th or West 3rd, I forgot. And I sat in with the band and uh, Sunrise asked me if I had a passport. And I said, no, he said, go get a passport because we're going to Paris next week. So, and then it's from then on, it's been like, no turning back. The Little Westbury was a very sophisticated program. And, and, and it was one of the, it was the first African American, one of the first, because you never know who's first, but one of the first African American music programs in, in this country, where that you went and you studied the music of Duke Ellington, Albert Isla, Sun Ra, John Coltrane. You studied this tradition, this great tradition of African-American music. So this is what we studied in school all the time. So I, and I, I, would, I saw Sun Ra many times when I was in school. So I was prepared for it from that side of it. You know, I understood what I was getting into and what, you know, it wasn't foreign to me, it wasn't alien to me. Now being in it is a different thing. I was very fortunate to join the band at this time because we went to Europe and we were supposed to go for a month or maybe three weeks a month. And we stayed there to June, July, October, June, July, August, September. We came back home in early October. And so, and we, and we were based in Paris. We stayed at the Hotel S in Paris. So it was, it was like a, a graduate study for me because I'm around Sun Ra every day and Sun Ra, everybody knows Sun Ra was a taskmaster as far as, he loved to rehearse, he loved to rehearse. So when we were, it was back in the days when things were less formal about bookings and stuff. So we had a couple of big bookings and enough to pay to get the band to Europe. And then he just barnstorming. We camped out at this Hotel S in Paris and his manager, Richard Wilkinson and his baritone saxophonist, Danny Thompson, they would just call people all over and say, we're here. You don't have to pay the airfare from the States. Give us a gig. And so, and so we studied. We studied a lot. We were there on the off days. We would rehearse in the hotel. Sunrise would usually have rehearsal in his hotel room around noon, one o'clock after lunch. And it was great because I got a chance really intense. It was a really intense four months where I really got a chance to really just be around him a lot, to be around Pat Patrick, John Gilmore, Marshall Allen, to be around these people a lot. 
and it was very intense. I, I was learning. I was learning, and I remember the first night. You know, Sun Ra has a thing always in the beginning where he playing, and the band is playing a collage, a kind of collage of sounds as a, as a group of collective improvisation, which he refers to as space chord. And then all of a sudden, he had, everybody stop and he point to you and tell you to play. And so I remember the first night, I was like, whoa. You know, so you just, you go for what you go for. And uh, then he go, then the next night, he might not ask you to do it, or the night, it's never no, but you know, but you just study it. So it was, it was, it was, it was uh, education for me because every night I had, you know, had to learn something. And he always says, you know, do something impossible. That was his thing. I, I don't want to hear the possible. I want to hear the impossible. Or, or make a make a good mistake. You know, there's bad mistake. Make a make make those good mistakes. So you know, enable you to just stretch out, stretch out. And and the, and the caliber players. When you listen to Marshall Allen, John Gilmore, and Pat Patrick, these and Charles Davis, these veterans who have been around a long time, and Sun Ra, you know, it was a, it was a it was a it was a high a high bar. So it was a, a, a day to day. Sometimes. You eat the bear, sometimes the bear eats you. That's how it was. Even though, even though I had been prepped well, it was, it was not, when I got in, it was like, whoa, this is different. And we were doing a lot of extended open form too. So that was like, I had heard and I've been familiarized with it, but just playing it is something different. And playing it cons consistently, you know, when you play every night, you have to come up, you have to come up, you have to come up, you have to step up. And you're trying to just make it better than the day before. Sun Ra performed in, his performance were in ritual sense. You know, you come out before him, it's like, like the preset where the band is, is dark and stuff. So like one musician, usually this one musician named James Jackson would come out and start with the drum. And then each musician would come out one at a time. They would come out of the slow thing and they would build this, this similar, this, this soul thing. And then Sun Ra would make his grand entrance and the band would be in, they would usually play this number called Discipline 27. And, they play that and then they sit down and they go through everything. But it was in a ritual sense. It wasn't about, uh, it was gonna be for a while. It was, it was gonna be a while. It was, it was, it was like a, the, the, sense, the form of ritual and, and uh, not introducing each piece, not talking in between each piece or very brief talking or the talking that was on stage was part of the music as opposed to, okay, we're going to play this number, stop. And you know, it was, it was ongoing, nonstop, nonstop. Even if there was talking, like he would talk, there would be some kind of sound going on. And uh, the whole approach about uh, something I, I, I referred to as Thai, total art integration, where he had the, the musicians playing, the video playing, the dancers moving. So you had this whole, the grand stage, the grand stage. And it's very powerful, it's very powerful. I think, I think that's, that's really one of his big influences on me. In 1988, and I'll tell you a lot to do with the projects, I saw the music industry changing. I just, we, you know, from traveling from 76 to 88, going back to Europe, spending a lot of time in Europe and Asia, I saw things were get, going to change. So I said around 88, 87, I just, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't lose interest, but I just said, there, there has to be something different. We can't, and I, and I saw the same audience. I saw the same, we were, we were getting uh, around uh, older, I guess, you know, I just, I just saw something. Uh, and I said, this is, some, something has to change. And so I, I kind of uh, started to work on projects, multimedia projects. And uh, I had a friend, a very close friend of mine, a great poet named Seiko Sundiata. We started collaborating, doing these projects. He was a great writer. And we just teamed up and we did a couple of beautiful projects. We did a project called Udu based on contemporary slavery in Africa during that time. And uh, we just started working a lot. And I also, I, I started doing this too because to help build audience. Because there's, uh, the people who didn't, who wouldn't come here to music, they would come see the dance, or they would come here to the to, to text, or they would come here to film. And so, okay, so I started working more. We did a couple of Elijah, then we did uh, The Mystery of Love, then we did a, then I did a piece, uh, what did I do? I did uh, 
Souls Within the Veil, based on Du Bois, uh, based on the book Souls of Black Folk by W.E.B. Du Bois. Du Bois. He's her, and, and I did another piece based on Harlem, about contemporary Harlem. And I did another piece based on James Weldon Johnson, God's Trombones. And all these pieces, these pieces were there. And, the, and another part of that thing is the new current project, which is the Brown Butterfly, based on the, the movement of Muhammad Ali, who was... Uh, and the base is, is, is based on a lot of these people like James Brown, Muhammad Ali, Michael Jordan, man, uh, Cameron, uh, the football player. They it defy, we defy, we constantly defy the expected and we do the unexpected. We do things like to be 210, 20 pounds and to move like this, this, like this, it's incredible. That's an innovation. That's an innovation. So... I remember uh, I went up to Massachusetts because I was working a lot in Western Massachusetts. There's a, there's, a, there's a think tank in Western Massachusetts, Williams College, Sandra Burton, Jonathan Seacole, they were all up there, Mass Smoker, where you know they were very uh, supportive of my work and I would go up there and do the, get a chance to do these projects. And so we did the Brown Butterfly and the, the process was uh, I, I got all the footage of him I could get and I just would cut all the sound off and I just would watch his movement, his gestures. And I'd write down a little rhythm, what he would, what he would do. And then I would, uh, then I used some uh, composition techniques I had been familiarized with, Maconda, Ken McIntyre, and Muhal Richard Abrams. And I just wrote this extended piece and we did it like full, full blast. Dancers, video, big stage. And uh, a lot of time when you do these pieces, it's beautiful, but then they, 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 they get affordable. They're very expensive to do walk with that many people. So I broke it down, Just we just recorded the music, and just get, I want to just get the music. Out.